OK, I just want to situate us. Um, uh, we found a new particle. And the we, as you heard, was um, actually 3,000 plus 3,000 scientists uh, at, at the Large Hadron Collider. It turns out 3,000 is the maximum number we can state. Obviously, it's not exactly 3,000. But above 3,000 becomes meaningless, apparently. So we just say 3,000. OK, so what are we doing? We, um, we are people who are bored with atoms. Uh, and so we're more interested in these things down here, quarks, electrons, um, and things of that size. Here, just in the size in atoms, if an atom is a 1, the thing I'm interested in is a 1 over 100. Thousand. Million. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> if you think about this in meters, uh, it's just very, very small. 10 to the minus. <laughs> we, we, we have, I personally have looked to see how big electrons are, and we know that they are smaller than 10 to the minus 18th meters, which is a billionth of a billionth of a meter. So pretty small. OK. so. The things I'm going to talk about today, I'm just going to assume you know this pretty well. These are the quarks. These are the leptons. These are the force carriers. Uh, and this, this Higgs thing is the thing, is the particle we found. And it, it's gray because we're not completely sure. We know we found it. We know it's a Higgs, but we're not completely sure it's the thing we thought it was. So um, I just want to let you know that these quarks were all really fun to discover, uh, mostly in America. These things mostly in, the, in Europe, um, not always in Switzerland. But we're going to tell a story uh, using these particles of how we found the Higgs boson. And in particular, we're going to talk about um, putting the Higgs in its place. So we're going to make sure it fits in that little hole there. Uh, and in doing this, what we have done is we have we have made a quest, and our quest has been successful. And the quest has been to excite the empty universe. So that's a little bit what I want to talk about. So this talk is about finding the Higgs boson. I'm going to tell you how we did that, and of course, what it is. And what it tells us about the Higgs field, which permeates all of space, and which tells us about the empty universe and how it is not really empty, and then finally what we're going to measure next. So in thinking about this talk, what I realized was the Higgs boson is great. But the Higgs boson is interesting because it tells us about the Higgs field. The Higgs field is a weird thing. It's like you take the universe and you take everything out, everything, all matter. And then you ask, what's there? Uh, that's, that's a thing, that's a, like, it's the kind of thing where your knees sort of go funny, right? What's in the universe with nothing in it? Well, that's what we're going to talk about. I'm, not, I'm an experimentalist and not a theorist, so I have one theory slide. And this is my theory slide, which I stole, because, of course, I'm not a theorist. Um, and my theory slide says this. We have a standard model of physics. It's very beautiful. And the standard model. We'll, we'll call it script L. Everything is in there. If we add the Higgs field, the thing we call this field permeating all of space, into our standard model and put it in the standard model machine and turn it on, what comes out is a Higgs boson. That's a particle that we found. And all the other quarks and leptons, but now they have mass. So now they have mass, which I got to tell you, is a really important thing. If an electron has no mass, then an atom isn't really bound. And then there isn't really us, and we can't really talk. And we're dead. <laughs> but we weren't really, we didn't die because we were never alive. OK, let's just go on. So I'm giving you an overview of what I'm going to talk about. Is there, if there are any questions at this level, please let me know. OK, so what is a particle? So first of all, I told you I found a Higgs boson, not by myself. But I have to tell you what that is. That's a particle. And I need to tell you how we find particles. OK, so what is a particle? Well, there are two kinds. There's stable particles, 
like the electron, doesn't decay, and like the top quark, which does decay in 10 to the minus 22 seconds. So there's two kinds. An unstable particle, like the top quark, decays whenever it wants. It was not going to tell you when. Um, it has no free will. It's just random. But when it decays, for, oops, when it decays, for instance, it decays to a W boson and a bottom quark, both things you saw on that chart, just particles we already know, we already made. And so what we can do to see the top quark is we can look at something called the invariant mass, some characteristic feature of the top quark, which is we can understand because we look at the W particle and we look at the B particle, the bottom quark, and we reconstruct this mass to find the mass of the top. Okay? So our whole idea here is we're going to look for a particle which is unstable, the Higgs boson, which decays really fast. We can't possibly see it first. And we're going to look at its decay products. And from those, we're going to reconstruct some characteristic of that particle. And we're going to call that the mass. And then we're going to say, wow, aren't we cool? So the one thing that you need to know, you don't really need to know, and I don't know whether you need to know, is that particles come in two kinds, fermions and bosons. Each particle acts as if it has a spin, some angular momentum. And so fermions have spin 1 half, and bosons have spin either 0 or 1. So they're different, and they have different, because of this, they're very different. Uh, in particular, if you have spin 0, you have no direction. So this is the particle. It's not really that big. The spin isn't really something spinning, because we can't tell. But you have these two things. And we're looking for a boson. We're looking for a boson. And first, let me tell you something, what we're trying to do. What is a particle, and how do we make it? Well, here's a glass. Here's a glass. Uh, it has no wine in it. But we know we can make it resonate. And we are about to do that. And when we make it resonate, we will find that if we ask the glass, how, many, how much power are you absorbing? OK? As I change the frequency with which I sing to the glass. So if I sing at exactly the right frequency, the natural frequency, the characteristic frequency of the glass, the power absorbed is very high. OK? That's what this little thing tells me. So very high. Now, why is there any width to this? bell curve. Well, it turns out that the width of this thing tells me how long the singing of the glass will last, how long the resonance will last. So let us actually do it. My, my dear friend, Daniel Rosenberg, is helping me tonight. He came all the way from the back here. <laughs> <laughs> and we have a glass, a wine glass, and we have a strobe light that's going to make us easier to see. We need to change that. And we are going to sing to it with a function generator. And if we sing at the right frequency, power will be absorbed, and we will be able to see the oscillations, the resonance of the glass. So you're starting to see it, but we're not quite there. Yeah. So the actual glass is resonating. And if we do this, if we see, well, how, what's the lifetime? We sing to it, then we turn it off, and you can still hear it, right? And then it dies away. That is the lifetime. Yeah, we're just going to get into this. <laughs> oh. <laughs> OK. So what you can see is that we are exciting this glass to a resonance. It has some kind of natural decay time. And then I think it's just. We've already showed you what we need to show you, but I think it's important to go all the way because we're experimentalists. So close your ears. Oh, wait. Oh. Sorry. Oh. How, how, how
people think it's going to break? Eventually. Okay, but nobody wants to go through that. What do I press here? One. Okay, well, you know what? Afterwards, we'll, we'll check to see whether that... Okay, here I'm giving you an analogy, but it's a really, really, really close analogy because for particles, unstable particles, I have exactly the same curve, the same power spectrum, but it's not power anymore. Now, this is the number of event when I make a new particle, which I call a resonance, okay? I count the number of particles I make, and instead of the frequency that I excite it at, I'm putting the invariant mass of the particle, this characteristic mass. And this is exactly the shape you would expect for an unstable particle. The width here of this is the lifetime, is one over the lifetime of the particle. So the particle has characteristic mass and lifetime. That's something we know about it. And it looks like this, which is the thing you need to know, just like a wine glass. Okay, now, we've done this before. I'm pretty old, as you heard from the introduction. I'm obviously really old. Um, so, for instance, the Z boson we made in 1982, the Z boson is on that chart as well, one of the force carriers. And here we see this characteristic curve this is the mass of the Z particle it decays to electron and a positron. When you reconstruct the invariant mass, it looks like a particle at 90 GeV in mass, 91. And it turns out that what you see here in the width is not actually the lifetime of the particle because our resolution of our detector is not so good. But the lifetime is something like 10 to the minus 22 seconds. Okay, so that's one example of a beautiful particle resonance that we've seen just like the wine glass. Here are some more. We do this all the time. We're masters at this. All kinds of particles, the phi, the lambda, the d, these are particles that are used to be really exciting <laughs> before the accident. Okay. And then the one which was a little bit more exciting was the top quark. How did we know we found a top quark? And this is actually pretty amazing. This is the beautiful curve for the top quark, this in blue. You can see it. When we discovered the top quark, we were looking for a bump. But even there, we could see that even though this is one, two, three, four events, we could see that something was there. OK. In this case, we were reconstructing the top decays to a W and a B, and we were reconstructing that mass. OK. Are you with me so far? OK. Now. Let's get back to the vacuum, because the vacuum is the place I want to go. I take all the matter out of the universe, and now I describe it, OK? Now, this guy, Sam, Sam, Sam Beckett, did the same thing with the literature, I think. He always just took everything out of everything. Sometimes he left a character. <laughs> Sometimes he left two characters. I think he was trying to do the same thing in a different way. I think he was deeply interested in the vacuum. Well, OK, what happens when you take all the matter out of the vacuum? Oh, <laughs> look at this. You don't even know what this is, but this happens. OK, all of a sudden, all of a sudden, out of the, photo out of the vacuum, a photon comes, turns into an electron-positron pair, and turns back into a photon, which goes away. <laughs> hey, and you say, how do you know? And I say, we know. That's another lecture. <laughs> we know there are these quantum fluctuations. They have effects, macroscopic effects. So these are quantum fluctuations from various fields. And then also, there's supposed to be this Higgs field. The Higgs field permeates everything. It has no direction. You can't tell. You can't feel it. You can't taste it, smell it. You can't do anything with it. So how do you know it's there? Well, how do you know it's there? Well, I'll tell you. We, what we're going to do, i tell you what we're going to do. This is going to be a really long lecture. <laughs> I, I really apologize ahead of time. What we're going to do is we are going to disturb the field that we can't see. We're going to disturb it. We're going to excite it. And that disturbance is going to be called a Higgs boson. Then we're going to make the disturbance. The disturbance will last 10 to the minus 22 seconds. We will find it through its mass, characteristic mass. And then we will say, you see there was a Higgs field. This is a great sleight of hand that is very beautiful. OK, what is a field, you're saying? 
this Higgs field. So a field, this is what I had up before, a field is something which is defined at every point in space. So for instance, the wind field, this is not all points in space, this is just the United States of America, so it's very jingoistic in a way. <laughs> Anyhow, the wind field, the wind is defined with a intensity and a direction at every point in, in, uh, in America. Okay, so we would call this a field. Okay, the Higgs field is going to be defined everywhere in the universe. It has no direction, okay, which is good because I can tell you one thing that I know for sure, although I'm not sure I know it, which is that there's nothing in an empty universe that has a direction. It would be really weird. It's, a, it's just the way it is. There can't be a preferred direction in the universe. Okay, so you say to me, okay, I can make a disturbance in the wind field, like a tornado, and I can definitely find that. I could also just find the wind. <laughs> With the Higgs, you, need, you can't find the Higgs. Well, for instance, if you had an electromagnetic field and you wanted to make a disturbance, you would do this. You would take an electron and you would shake it up and down like this, and photons would come out, and that would be a disturbance. Or if you had a gravitational field, you would take the sun and you would shake it up and down, <laughs> and gravity waves would come out. Wow. But in the Higgs field, what we need to do is a little bit weird. We can't just pick something up and shake it, so we're going to actually have to collide quarks into each other. Quarks, really little things. And by doing that, we're going to create this disturbance. So let's just take a vote. The coolest thing ever or Maybe biology is better. <laughs> sorry, sorry, I didn't mean to bring up that. Uh, okay. Okay. So if you disturb the Higgs field, you get the Higgs boson. What does it take? It takes a lot of energy in a small space and a lot of shaking. A lot of shaking. All right. So we use particle accelerators. Uh, what, why do we use accelerators? So we want to make a lot of energy in a small space. And then we want to say, well, we're going to accelerate these particles up to have very high energy. We're going to use that energy and magically turn it into mass. So we're going to take the energy of these particles, like protons, and turn it into mass of a new Higgs boson. OK, so this is how we do things. We do it via the idea of scattering. And scattering is something you do every day. Uh, you, you do it, you're part of it, let's call it that. The sun shines light on something, possibly a small dog. Can't really tell <laughs> from this picture. The light has some wavelength, it scatters off, it goes into your eye, which is usually connected to your brain, <laughs> and that's connected to your lips. Those are lips. And then you would say dog. This is the basic idea of scattering. Now, the, the second idea of scattering is that you replace the sun with an accelerator. And you replace it. So that means you can make this wavelength anything you want. You can make it really, really small. OK, so you have really good resolution. With small wavelength, you have really good resolution. You can see a dog inside an atom, which is a weird idea. And then you replace your eye with a, you know, $550 million detector uh, that takes you 20 years to build. And the brain is, is considered part of the detector. Still, you have lips, like mine now. OK, so idea, this is, we're going to do scattering. Now, this is a simple part of scattering, but we're actually going to do a little bit different scattering. We're going to take protons and we're going to smash them together. We're not going to look at dogs. We've done, we, we have looked at dogs and we've finished with it. <laughs> okay, so we're going to collide protons and we're going to collide them at the Large Hadron Collider at CERN. Now, I just want to say something about CERN, which is one of the most amazing places you, um, in the world. It's just on the French-Swiss border. And CERN came to be after the Second World War when Europe had lost many of its uh, greatest scientists. And people said, Let's make one big lab for all the countries and concentrate science there, and it will become one of the great places in science. And there was a huge amount of help from, of course, from the US, but, but intellectually mostly from immigrants, scientific immigrants to the US, in particular 
uh, Isidore Rabi uh, and Vicky Weisskopf, who were two great scientists of the 20th century. So these are two guys. This is the CERN site. I love their outfits, <laughs> which is why I put it there. Uh, right now, there's like an enormous, huge, amazing uh, accelerator center where an enormous amount of physics has been produced. And so it was, an, it was a great success. I'm just saying it was a huge success to put an enormous amount of money into uh, science all in one place where people work together from different countries. OK, so that was a thank you, CERN. Um, and uh, yeah, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to collide protons together. And then we're going to make a huge amount of energy here. From that energy, we could make a massive particle. OK? And that's going to be, hopefully, uh, the Higgs. We already made a, a more massive particle by doing this, uh, the top quark. So the top quark is 175 billion electron volts, and the Higgs is only 126. So this is what we're going to do. And all kind of stuff comes out. And I'll show you what kind of stuff is. And then we're going to see what happens. Did we create a Higgs? So we're going to do this every 50 nanoseconds for a year or two. Uh, and then we're going to get you know, a handful of events. OK, just a, this is sort of like a, what do you call it? Uh, truth uh, caveat, caveat. This is a proton. Uh, a proton is not an elementary particle. It's made of quarks and, and gluons. And it doesn't really have a shell. That's not there. So when you accelerate a beam of protons very fast, what you have is a bunch of quarks and gluons moving very fast. Okay? So when you collide these two protons, you're not actually colliding two protons. Because this proton, this proton is moving so fast that this proton doesn't see the whole proton. It just sees what's inside. But you can't say inside because there's no skin. It's just getting complicated. Let's just say, imagine for a second, forget protons. All you want to say is that we are colliding quarks and gluons. But we don't know when we're colliding them every single time they collide. We don't know what's colliding. We don't know anything about the initial state event by event. But we know on average. OK. So, oh. Uh, I just wanted to remind you of these particles because they're so beautiful. And this is me. This is a picture of me finding the top quark uh, <laughs> on my shoe. This is before children. The, you can't see it very well, but here are the U, D, and S on my Chanel suit here. <laughs> OK, so there are four forces. Uh, just, this is just for completeness. Electromagnetic, everything you touch, everything you feel. Electromagnetism, a beautiful force you can turn on and off. Uh, Weak force, which is responsible for radioactive decay. The strong force keeps the proton, the nucleus together. And then the gravitational force, which it doesn't interest us today. Um, it's very, very weak, although very beautiful in its own way. OK, so a typical scattering at a collider would be a quark and an anti-quark. I know this is a weird picture. But this is the way Feynman <laughs> talked about things. Time is going in this direction, OK? A quark and an anti-quark all of a sudden meet, annihilate, turn into a Z particle or maybe a photon, we're not sure, and then decays to an electron and a positron. Okay? What we do, what my job is, is thinking about all possible things that can happen like this with the particles we have, all possible diagrams, and measuring them. Do they exist or not? Do they happen or not? Okay? So for instance, these things can happen. An electron can just spit out a photon. That's electromagnetic force. A quark can spit out a gluon or absorb a gluon. And that's the strong force. A gluon itself can spit out a gluon. OK? A top quark can decay to a W and a bottom. That's the weak force. So quarks can change their flavor, or a charm quark can stay a charm quark and spit out a Z0. These are the little building blocks in my toolbox of making Feynman diagrams and then seeing if they exist. Okay, So if I add the Higgs 
Well, the Higgs can couple to a top and an anti-top, to a W plus and a W minus, to a Z and a Z, to, to any two particles that have mass. The Higgs can also couple to itself, which is this kind of, mm, it's complicated. <laughs> I was going to say onanistic, but <laughs> then I thought maybe that would leave a bad taste in <laughs> people's mouths. Um, okay, so I've told you what I do. I have all the building blocks. I know all the possible couplings of particles. And now I'm going to put it all together and I say, okay, no problem. Look what I can do. I can take a gluon from one proton and a gluon from the other proton. <laughs> they can somehow weirdly turn into a top anti-top and a top anti-top here, which then can, oh, there's an uh, anti-top here, sorry, uh, which then can annihilate into a Higgs boson, because we know that exists, and then the Higgs can decay to ZZ, and then the Z we know can decay to mu plus mu minus and mu plus mu minus. So all I've done is written down something that I know could happen, and the only question is, how often does it happen? So this is a very fun game, and it's a game that young people can play of any age. <laughs> you can write down, and, it's, and that's kind of cool, because, because I feel young. <laughs> okay, I just want to tell you that the experiment we do at CERN, there are two experiments, and you know, they're multi-purpose experiments. Higgs is just one thing that we are looking for. And this is Peter Higgs. He just got the Nobel Prize. He, among uh, some other theorists, a few theorists, predicted the Higgs boson and the Higgs field as a way to solve a, a problem in, in the standard model. Uh, we didn't believe it. Uh, when I say we here, I'm referring to we, the experimentalists who don't like to listen to theorists, but do anyway. Uh, we were all Higgs schmigs. But of course, we looked for it in our spare time. I'm just, this is just sort of an idea of who we are. We are looking for many, many things. The Higgs is just one of the things. We didn't really say Higgs schmigs. That was just actually only me. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't say it very loud. <laughs> OK. So are we, still, are we still on the same page? OK. <laughs> yeah, you want to be on my page. How to make a Higgs? Well, in the same way that I did it before, I can tell, I know the Higgs coupling, I know all the other forces and how things couple. Couple means, you know, how these things go together. So I know I can take two gluons and make a Higgs through a top quark. Turns out that the Higgs likes to couple the heavy things more than light things. So a top is very heavy, so this is very nice. Or uh, a quark can come along, it can spit out a, a W, the other one can spit out a W, those two Ws can fuse to make a Higgs. That's pretty nice. Or we can have something like this. A quark and an anti-quark can make a W, and then the W can spit out a Higgs. So all these things do happen. We haven't seen them all, but we've seen some of them, and I'll talk about that. So we know how to make the Higgs, and then we need to know how the, the Higgs decays, but it decays to all pairs of particles. So all we need to do is build an enormous accelerator and build a detector or two. And that's only going to take about 20, 25 years. That's the Mont Blanc. This is the jet d'eau. This is the lake, Geneva. This is the, the fog. <laughs> <laughs> this is going ahead. OK, this is the accelerator, 27 kilometers underground. Uh, it was used for another experiment before, a very, very beautiful experiment where we collided electrons and positrons. Now it's used to collide protons and protons. But it's very beautiful, and when you go there, you feel the beauty. Every day you look at the Mont Blanc, every day you can see it, which is like one or two days. Um, okay, so what happens? So what happens is we're underground because we have to protect everybody from uh, the radiation. And it's better to be underground. So we go, you know, uh, 80 meters underground. And we put a tunnel. And then we put holes to four places so that we can get the experiments down. We put all the experiments down through these holes. And around this place, we have two beams of protons going in opposite directions. 
And at four places, they collide. So these are the beams. Here they are colliding. You squeeze them down just before they collide, so it's very, very intense. OK, so here's my experiment, Atlas. It's closer to the cafeteria than CMS. <laughs> Atlas was supposed to be the nice group. But when you get 3,000 people, they're the same. I mean, in each. The other two experiments are just for other stuff, um, specific stuff. OK, here's, look how beautiful this is. This is a magnet. You know, when you want to uh, accelerate the protons round and round, you have to bend them, or else they, don't, they just go straight. Uh, and so we have two, these huge superconducting magnets w with two beam pipes. And only in these four places do the beams cross. OK? So this is sort of what it looks like. You can see the bend. Uh, and here are two guys just hanging out. But they're not hanging out um, when it's on, because then they're dead. <laughs> uh, I shouldn't use the word dead. They're not, they, that would never happen, because there's lots of protection and everything. And also, they have their hard hats on. Um, <laughs> let, me just say, let me just say that it's 27 kilometers of superconducting magic. So this is an amazing feat of engineering for any engineers in here. Uh, it is the biggest, it's the coldest place in the world. Um, I mean, not, it could be colder somehow in outer space. But uh, it is pretty amazing. Liquid helium cools down to a very low temperature. Uh, so that the magnets are superconducting, so they don't have a lot of resistance. OK, so because it's liquid helium, you have to wear, you know, you can, get, you can get into trouble. So you have to wear a lot of equipment in case the liquid helium leaks out. So this looks very fun. Wouldn't you like to be there? OK, boy, boy, time just flies. Am I talking too fast? I don't have any sense. OK, this is amazing. So this is what's actually happening. You have these two beams. You have bunches of particles. There's 10 to the 11th protons in a bunch, OK? 10 to the 11th is, is 100 billion. Thanks. <laughs> so, and these, and you have like 2,000 bunches going. So 2,000 bunches going one way, 2,000 bunches going the other way. They collide every 50 nanoseconds, which is a billionth of a second. OK? And every time they collide, maybe 20 protons will interact, or 20 quarks will interact with 20 gluons. That's a, so there will be 20 proton-proton interactions. And you have to sort those out. OK? So you have these bunches of particles, and then you have the protons. But then really, as I said, these partons, these quark and gluons inside the protons, are actually the one doing the business. And then what happens is you have a collision, and stuff comes out of the collision, and you have to actually figure out what it is. So for instance, this is a Higgs particle being made, which immediately decays, and you're getting four electrons that come out. So in the Higgs case, you are selecting one in, uh, this is going to be difficult. I'm not good with zeros. Three, six, nine, twelve. What? 10,000 billion. OK, Here, here's the point. You do this a lot, you get very few events. you got to make sure you get them. That's an enormous feat of engineering. So here we go. We have 2,800 bunches. Here it says 25 nanoseconds. We hope to do that soon, but we weren't able to do that yet. Um, so we have 10 to the ninth a billion proton-proton collisions per second. And something like 1,600 charged particles are in the detector at any one time. It's a very, very difficult situation, OK? So a bit, a, when you, you want really high luminosity to make these luminosity. You want a lot of energy and a lot of um, uh, protons hitting each other in order to make this Higgs boson. But on the other hand, you don't want 50 interactions happening at the same time, because it's hard to find the Higgs one. So that's something that we have to worry about. It's called pileup. We have a trigger, which is something, an incredibly smart, very fast thing, which says, I don't want this event. I do want this event. I don't want it. I do want it. Okay. So we are able to go from this huge number of collisions to putting on disk uh, only something like 3,200 terabytes per year. Okay. Uh, 
that's sort of just like three billion books. <coughs> but they're, sh they're short books. <laughs> OK. So this is sort of the kind of thing that happens when you have a collision of these two protons, or in this case, 20 protons and 20 protons. A lot of charged particles come out. A lot because when these quarks interact, the rest of the proton sort of breaks up and turns into charged particles. And so this is this kind of thing you're going to look at. What you see here is there's a couple of high momentum particles coming out. And you hope to look at those and find out what's going on. So what are we doing? Uh, here's, people always show this picture. This is the Big Bang, apparently. Um, this, is, uh, this is many things, but time. As time goes by, the universe expands. And, and actually, even the Pope says so. <laughs> this is actually a Pope, a Pope approved. Um, pope approved. Uh, which I think is great. Anyway, um, time goes, the universe expands. Uh, and so what we think we're doing is we are colliding quarks and gluons at the same energies they would be colliding naturally when the universe was 10 to the minus something, 19 seconds. So we're, we are making in our lab a situation which is very much like a w really a long time ago. And some people find that cool. I'm not really. <laughs> That's not the coolest part of what we do. The coolest part of what we do is we understand the vacuum. I've got to go really fast now. Um, this is our detector. It took 15 years to build. Basically, you want to surround this collision of the quarks and gluons, which happens here. These are the beams coming in. With every kind of detector, so every particle that comes out, you can measure its momentum and its energy, and you can reconstruct the event, and eventually reconstruct the mass. It is very beautiful. These are people, although they are Swiss. <laughs> the Americans aren't that much bigger. They're oh. There is an American there. <laughs> um, I'm just kidding about the Swiss. This, this, this is on the Swiss side, though, very close to the French side, though. OK, so this is our detector. The part we built here at Harvard looks like this, but is in here. It's a muon detector. So we spent 10 years building detectors here uh, and, uh, and installing them, and, and then having to go up in those lift alofts to, to put the cables on, which is really scary. Um, OK, I'm not going to go through this. I just want to say that here that it started, how this whole Large Hadron Collider started. It started in the 1980s with the idea we were going to build the superconducting super collider here, but in 1993 it got killed in an accident. And so the letter of intent for the LA, so the super collider was 40 TeV in the center of mass. Our, our experiment here uh, that we actually found the Higgs was 8 TeV in the center of mass. So you see that the LHC had smaller vision, uh, but they got it built. And so it took from the, basically from October 1990 to 2012. That's 22 years, sort of. It's a lot of time. Um, OK, so when we build a particle detector, everything is about ionization. When a charged particle goes through gas, it ionizes the atom. OK, it knocks off electrons. And so you can see a trail. OK, so this is where the beams collide. These are where the particles come out. We put a big magnetic field there to bend the particles. And we measure the momentum by how much they bend. Then we put big detectors to make the particles interact and leave all their energy. And we measure that energy so we know not only what kind of particle they were, but how much energy they had. Then we have muon detectors. Muons can go through, muons are just heavy electrons. They can go through lots of matter. And then they can go through these detectors here. So they're on the outside. So this is sort of what you would see from an interaction. Lots of particles coming out. And we build this whole thing. It's a lot of countries 
I'll show you in a minute. But in the end, it's an enormous thing. It's not even clear what it looks like to you. I mean, I know what it is, but it just looks, here's where the beam is. Um, luckily, it's not near his head. No, uh, this is while we're building it. Okay, this is a picture of the muon detectors. Last week, we had two theorists who were here on a panel who said that their entire lives changed when they went in and saw this, when they actually went in and saw the detector. It's just incredibly tall. <laughs> it's very big. Okay, now, amazingly enough, the Atlas collaboration is run democratically, n by which I do, do not mean that people vote on what's right or wrong, but it is somehow democratic. Um, that, and we have, I'll show you in a second, but these are people from all over, all over, not just the CERN states, member states, but Argentina, Vietnam, you can't see anything here, even the United States of America. <laughs> really, look at all these things, Georgia, and the, by which they mean the country. So <laughs> people all over the world are getting up early on Skype and going to meetings. Okay, this is the collaboration org chart. I just think this is amazing. It was actually um, not a manifesto, but a constitution, which is kind of interesting. And I think people are finding it interesting just to look at these huge collaborations and say, how on earth does that work? You know, companies are interested. How on earth does it work? Collaboration board, uh, you, you can't see much, can you? Spokesperson, that's a person. Uh, Technical coordinator, resource <laughs> coordinator, executive board. So basically what happens is when someone wants to publish something, they send it out to everyone and then everyone sends comments and then they have to spend months answering the comments and then eventually if all the comments and, and objections are answered, they eventually can publish it. So it's not a vote exactly, but it is a democratic process. Okay, this is the one I like best. This is the age distribution in our experiment and this is sort of less than 25, you know, and this, the red is uh, women, the blue is men. So the good news is, uh, for the young people, this is the good, not a good ratio, but it's a better ratio than this one where I am. <laughs> Luckily, just so you know, at first I thought, am I that person? But then it turns out that's 50, so. Anyhow, the good news is the more people you have, the more women there are, therefore the happier you are, there's less eczema. Okay, <laughs> we really gotta go fast. We have only 10 minutes to discuss everything. So, <laughs> here's, this is what we said we were gonna look for. Glue, glue, goes through a top loop to Higgs. Higgs then decays to Z, Z star, and you get four leptons out. This is what the event could look like. This is a candidate event. On an event by event basis, we don't know exactly what happens, but this certainly looks like something. Um, oh, here's, I just wanted to show you something simple. So here's just a Z boson decaying to electron positron. So here you have the side view, proton coming in, proton coming in. These yellow things going out would be the electron and positron. You can see them in the tracking detector and then in the calorimeter where they lose energy. From the end on view, if you take this end on, like we saw it in the pictures, you see these two yellow, very, very, high momentum tracks, because they're not bending much, and then energy in the electromagnetic calorimeter. When I unfold that calorimeter into a sort of world map, I see two very energetic, very clear electromagnetic signals, which would be the electron and positron. So here's an example of what we see one event in our detector. Okay, um, and here's an example of the underlying multiple vertex problem. When I look, see, look in here? There's a lot of tracks in there, right? A lot of little tracks. When I look very carefully at this region here, I see many, many different vertices. That means that it's not just one proton hitting one proton or one quark hitting one quark, that it's 10 at the same time. So you go, at first, when we were young, we said, oh my God, we'll never do this. And people called it dirty, but, but we love it. I, th I prefer to think of it as mulch. Anyhow, this is a problem. You have to make sure that the particles came from the same point. I'm, the only reason I'm pointing this out is because I just want to show you how incredibly brilliant we are. <laughs> really, we found the Higgs boson in this. Sh sh <laughs> OK, 
Okay, here we go. Uh, Higgs to ZZ, candidate events. So the Higgs is going to decay to ZZ, it's going to decay to four electrons, and what do I see? When I look from the side view, I see three high momentum particles, four high momentum particles, and then energy in the calorimeter. When I look on end view, I see the same particles in red, and then energy. So it's kind of beautiful, right? Are you, it's not beautiful? Am I boring? I could be less boring. Let's be less boring. I love that. Look at that. <laughs> That's like a Higgs candidate, which goes to uh, four leptons. You can see one, two, three, four. This is an end on view. You see all these particles in there? Wow. OK, and this is another view showing my beautiful detector, the muon detectors. So here is where it's all happening. Here's these huge muon toroids, which bend the, the muon so we can measure the momentum. These things are so, when you look at it, you just have to think about it as art for the first time. So think of that as art. Here's where it's happening. OK, so we did this a lot. We did it for a long time. Everybody worked really hard. And then, and then, uh, and then we decided to see if we saw a bump. Remember that bump? Remember that wine glass? Do you remember back then? Yeah. OK. So this is the mass of four leptons. So I'm going to see if the Higgs decayed to four leptons. I'm going to take those four leptons. I'm going to make, I'm going to reconstruct an invariant mass, a characteristic mass. And here's the number of events. I'm just going to see if it's there. And I'm going to see if I can actually do this with this thing. Nope? OK. So ready? So what's going to happen is it, it's going to pretend it's real time, but it's not real time. But it, this is the order in which it happened in real time, I mean, in life. Ready? You're saying, what the hell is that? That's good. That's good. Oh, there it is. Let me start again. And I'll. OK, so let's stop. Oh, sorry. I thought I could stop right there. What's happening is, what you're seeing is events coming in, OK? They all have different masses. You see some weird stuff. But that's because even though we're trying to make, look for Higgs goes to four leptons, lots of things make four leptons. You realize how many possible things can happen? I showed you anything can happen. So we have a whole bunch of other stuff happening. Amidst all that, we have to find the peak, which is the Higgs. So let's try again. Let's look again. I will look really carefully, OK? And I'll tell you where to look. See that? So all the red is background. We expect that. This is not expected, OK? These events here are not expected unless we have a Higgs particle. So this down here is data minus background. So right here, so if, if data equals background, you got nothing. But when data minus background is big, you know there's a signal. So this thing here is the signal for the Higgs boson. This, this here is only six, 18 events, 18, 15. It's a really small number. So this is the mass. So this is my wine glass resonance, OK? Are you, guys, you guys seem very quiet. When I ask, what do I expect if there was a Higgs boson at 126 GV, that's what it is, the blue. From the standard model, if the Higgs boson is 126 G GV, that's what I would see. So we say, wow, we totally rock. Has anybody got a question? I mean, this is really, oh my god. This is so beautiful, it's hard to believe. OK. <laughs> now, you should be thinking in your mind, and I'm sure you are, I don't believe her. You would have to see the Higgs in many, many channels before you believe, many, many decay channels before you believed it existed. That could be anything. That could just be like dirt like, or anything getting in, the w in your eye. It could be something like that. And so. We have, we have a, since we have 3,000 people, we have a whole bunch of people looking at different things. For instance, glue, glue goes through this top loop, makes a Higgs, then goes through a WW loop to make 
photon photon. Pretty weird. Higgs can't couple directly to photon photon because photons have no mass. So we look for this, okay? Again, we just collide protons for this, and then we see what comes out. We're looking for two photons. And what do we see in our event? When we look end on, we see no high momentum tracks. Photons are neutral, so they don't leave, they don't ionize. And then we have two energy clusters, two electromagnetic clusters. From the side view, it's hard to see one, two energy. So this is a candidate Higgs to photon photon event. Okay? No? So within the standard model, yeah, no, standard model gives the coupling once you know the mass. The standard model tells you everything once you know the mass of the Higgs. So you just say, if the Higgs is this, the, the coupling is that, da 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 okay? So we are going to now see this, another amazing thing. This now is the mass, in reconstructed characteristic mass of the Higgs in photon, photon. This is the number of events, okay? So... This one's going to be a bit weirder. You're going to be freaked out. Whoa, there's a huge background and a tiny little bump. Are, you would say that doesn't look like the wine glass. But you know, if you take away the background, it kind of looks like the wine glass. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's the, that's the Higgs boson. OK, I, don't, I probably don't need to keep going with this, right, with the Higgs boson thing. I could go on forever because we measure it in a lot of different ways. We measure it in Higgs to WW. We measure it in Higgs to tau tau. But I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna bore you with that stuff. I, ca I can later if you ask a question. Okay. Then you say, Hey, Franklin, how do you know it's real? And how do you know it's significant? How do you know it's not a statistical fluctuation? Uh, and so we ask ourselves this question all the time, and we say. For a given number of events, this p-value, whatever I'm plotting here, the probability to observe as many events as this number in our peak or more under the assumption that the Higgs does not exist. So we ask, what's the probability that we would see what we see if the Higgs does not exist? And the answer is, as a function of mass of the Higgs, so here's where we think the Higgs is, the probability to see the number of events we see if there were no Higgs is... 10 to the minus 21. And that's something like nine, six, nine standard deviations. So you go, whoa, well, only nine standard deviations. <laughs> In my psychology experiment. <laughs> <laughs> so I apologize. I apologize. <laughs> Let's cut that part out of the thing. And this is where particle physicists really <laughs> dominate in a sense. Um, because we love statistics so much. Anyway, it's pretty unlikely that this is not the Higgs boson. That's what I'm trying to get across. But we do actually check. Um, and so now the question is not, is this the Higgs boson? Is it one of many Higgs bosons? Or is it just the only Higgs boson? And does it have the right spin? Yes. Uh, and does it have the right coupling? And we, we've measured some of that. Oh, that's the beautifulness. Oh. I just, this is not moving. So I thought I would just show you. That's the red. That's our beautiful Higgs. So what we're going to do, we found a particle. It's the Higgs boson. It's 126 GeV. Um, and we're going to measure everything about it. We are down now. They're fixing the, the accelerator. And in May, we turn on at a higher energy, twice as high as we were, which means that all of a sudden, we could create new particles that no one has ever seen before except if they happen to be sitting around in the early universe before there were atoms. Um, sorry. And we want to learn about the Higgs boson, but we also want to learn about the Higgs field. So I want to talk just very briefly in, in the zero minutes I have. CERN. Oh, I started late. OK, does it behave as we expect? Da, 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 da. Well, we don't know. OK. Let's go on. One second more. So what about the Higgs field? We talked about the fact that we were just disturbing the Higgs field 
to see if it was there. And we had to check by looking for the Higgs boson. It only took 30 years. So how do we feel now? So this is, a, this is, a, this is art, but it's really, I feel like it's me wa walking through the universe now. And that's the Higgs field around me. I feel so happy like this. You don't need to wear clothes or anything. Um, so I guess the point is, what does this tell us about the Higgs field? For, many, I, for me, as an experimentalist, I needed to make the Higgs boson in order to believe in the Higgs field. Theorists knew the Higgs field was somehow there because there are all kinds of sort of indirect reasons it had to be. But for me, I had to do it myself. So what can we do now? Well, this, is, this, this guy once wrote a book. He's a philosopher from Canada, where I'm from. Uh, he wrote a great book about particle physics and about scientific realism in which he says, if you can spray it, it's real. So I feel like I can spray quarks and gluons to, do, to make a Higgs boson. I can now spray <laughs> W particles to make a Higgs boson. I can't quite spray Higgses, but I'm, I'm hoping to get there before I die. So biology is important. Anyway, <laughs> if you can spray it, it's real. So that's a kind of different sense. So when we go back and say, now I finally feel this Higgs field, I finally feel the cosmic stuff happening, um, it's because I'm an experimentalist. Everybody's been feeling that for a long time. So the question about the Higgs field is, we have this idea of what the Higgs field should look like. And we've measured almost everything about it. And the question is, it looks like a hat, the Higgs field. This is the Higgs field. And this is a hat. And the question is, does the hat fit? And I think that's something. So I wanted to tell you this because I wanted to say, not just does the bo is the boson, does the disturbance look like it should, but does the whole idea fit? And so we have this idea that when you have a, a ball in a well like this, it always goes to the bottom. It see, wants to be at the lowest energy state. But if you have a, a well like this instead, the ball sitting at the top feels very unstable and will probably fall down. But when it falls down, it's going to fall in one or two places. And if this is in three dimensions, you know, anywhere around this ring. So I'm going to show you that what the Higgs field is, is actually like that, like this hat. So at very, very high temperatures in our story of the world, this potential or this well, which is not really a physical well, but an energy well, and this is not a distance, but instead this is now the Higgs field, how intense the Higgs field is. At very high temperatures, the well looks like this, and the universe sits here in the middle. As the universe cools, all of a sudden, the well turns into this green thing. Wow. All of a sudden, we were in a, a universe where the Higgs field was off, and now all of a sudden it's on. Now it has a, the Higgs intensity is there in the vacuum no matter what. It's filling the vacuum, and now we're sitting here. So what we'd like to do, I know this is so weird, what we'd like to do is we'd like to measure this green curve very well. <coughs> By measuring the mass of the Higgs, we've measured the curvature right here, OK? We've already measured this, how far out this dip is in the hat. But we don't know so much about this end. And only saying, well, the standard model must say what this is. So what we're doing in the next 20 years or 40 years is to actually measure what the Higgs field looks like in empty space. One thing that you may have heard about in maybe the Daily Mail or <laughs> uh, is that it's possible that the universe is not in a great place. And I'll tell you what they mean. If this is my hat again, remember, if, if this part is my hat, okay, and this is where I'm sitting, it's possible that there's another place, another minimum. Here's a minimum. There's another minimum way down here, way down in a bad place that the universe could also be in. And there's a terrible thing called quantum mechanical tunneling, which means that this 
even if it doesn't have enough energy to jump over here, could get here. And here could be a bad place for us in terms of longevity. <laughs> OK. Uh, OK. Last thing. I skipped over supersymmetry, but trust me. <laughs> <laughs> it's a beautiful thing, but it's not there yet. <laughs> um, OK, this is getting way too theoretical. What am I talking about? So I just wanted to bring it down to Earth again, but also to sort of tell you who we are, these experimental physicists who do this kind of stuff. So this story starts here. For some reason, I had to learn about the cartoon laws of physics. Someone called me up on the phone and said, could you please learn about the cartoon laws of physics? I said, I will. And it turns out it's amazing. Like, there's just 20 laws, and all cartoons follow them. And I started to think to myself, how weird is that? Like, what's the underlying thing going here, these cartoon laws of physics? Well, so let's just go through a few, and then we'll learn why. OK, so uh, the first one is just that, um, you know, gravity doesn't work until you look down. I think you've all seen cartoons. Um, uh, as speed increases, objects can be in more than one place at the same time. <laughs> That, that's obvious. Law, uh, the anvil always falls more slowly than a person. It always gets hit on the head of the anvil. And then also, a body passing through solid matter leaves exactly the shape of the body. OK, so these, it's just, uh, there, there are more. But I wanted to talk, I thought a lot about this. And then I came across something that I found pretty interesting. I can't believe I'm going over so bad. I really apologize. Anybody can leave who wants to. So I, this is Walt Disney. And Walt Disney had an answer. And I thought you might want to share it. Trust me, almost over. The talk is almost over. Impossible cartoon actions will seem plausible if the viewer feels the action he is watching has some factual basis. For example, the idea that pulling a cow's tail could ring a bell hanging on her neck may seem far-fetched. But it has some basis in fact. There is an anatomical connection between the bell here and the tail here. That is the spinal column. And so it seems entirely plausible that pulling her tail would ring the bell. OK. So, <laughs> so he sort of explained um, why there's only a few cartoon laws of physics. But then I started thinking about, vis-a-vis well, -vis me, I started thinking about myself. Just, I haven't talked about myself much in this talk, and I, I've been going to therapy about it. But <laughs> I'm doing pretty well, but I just want to get this in. Who am I? Why do particle physicists do what they do? And I thought this was an incredibly good quote. Particle physics is the unbelievable in pursuit of the unimaginable. To pinpoint the smallest fragments of the universe, you have to build the biggest machine in the world. To recreate the first millionth of a second of creation, you have to focus energy on an awesome scale. So what I realized was the cartoon laws of physics are the plausible impossible. But what I look for, and especially when I'm looking for my friends the theorists' ideas in new particles, I'm looking for the implausible possible. Anyhow, I just wanted to thank you for sitting here and listening to that, and I hope you enjoyed yourselves. And, and you can ask questions if you want. I, I have a, someone has a mic, I think. Do we have a mic? Take this one. Oh. Um, I was interested in maybe knowing all of the cartoon laws of physics at oh. some point. <laughs> so Google cartoon laws of physics. And it's true that I have to say that it was a Harvard student who wrote them down for the first time. He didn't come up with them, of course, but he was the one who discovered them. So if you could cartoon laws of physics in Google, you can get it. I can't remember them all. Yeah. Uh, here. Great. 
thank you for your talk. Uh, my question is, <coughs> um, is there any plan in the near future, maybe 10 or 20 years for CERN uh, that discover the graviton in the theory of, uh, in theory of string theory? Yeah, thanks. The graviton. Yep. Hmm. Yeah. Um, well, it probably wouldn't be the, grav the normal graviton, but uh, maybe the gravitino. So, so there are many, many, many models of called beyond the standard model, and we might find any of those things because none of them are ruled out. That's how it works. None of the theories can be ruled out already, so they can actually happen. But can we, if you're asking the question is, can we show whether string theory is right or not uh, in, the in the next 20 years? Well, we, we, it would, we probably could if there was a prediction. But um, the problem a lot, no, that's, is that's a, a little glib, but the, the string theory makes a lot of predictions at very, very high energy that we cannot reach in the next 20 years, unless, unless me saying this spurs some incredible, ingenious young person to, to make that not true. Yeah, probably not. By the end of 20 years, we will know exactly whether there is more Higgses We'll know exactly about this Higgs, well, let's say 40 years, and then we'll know what that hat looks like. Perfectly. Yeah, up there. We know that the Higgs boson behaves to four muons or four leptons, and we know the masses of those four particles. Why is there such uncertainty about the mass of the Higgs boson? Oh, well, the Higgs itself has its own natural width, its own lifetime. The Higgs particle. So the four particles it decays into have their masses and width. But the Higgs itself has its own width. However, I just want to tell you what's really true. Am I not? Uh, the, what's really true is that our detector has a resolution in measuring things. And that resolution is great, but gives a width to, the, to this bell-shaped curve that's not the characteristic width of the particle. Does that make sense? So we're just not very good at measuring stuff. <laughs> well, but we are really good, but not infinitely good. Does that make sense? So resolution says that when the particle, you know, momentum is 1 GV, we say, well, it's 1 plus or minus 0.2 GV, something like that. Uh, yeah. Does that answer your question, sort of? Uh, yeah. <laughs> really? I, you know, it's, uh, it's very, very hard to measure the natural width of particles that have a very narrow natural width. Yeah. If you don't know the initial energy of the Higgs, there are many processes which, I mean, the Einstein gives this a net, it gives this a net. Can you? So Sorry. therefore, when, when Oh, oh, so. So um, it's, it has to do with the ambiguity of, the end no, no. products sometimes giving different masses. Once the Higgs is made and decays, you know everything about it. You know its momentum, you know its mass. You know, but you know initial. No, you, you, there's no initial. It, when it decays, it decays to these things, and from these things, there's not, there's. I, I don't mean, I, don't, I know that I should presume yeah. that you know, but when you start doing this experiment, you know in principle. Oh, no. Fair, you should not know what the No, we have to check. Uh, it's all very well specified how these things decay, and we look for those things, and then uh, I'm not sure where the ambiguity comes in that you're talking about, but I don't think it's there. I ten to the minus twenty-two seconds. Uh, so the the lifetime is ten to the minus twenty-two seconds. So the width is. What's okay, guys? What's the <laughs> what's the width of the Higgs boson? Okay, MeV, so not GeV. So you see that it's much, much, much smaller than our resolution. So we can't measure it directly here. Yeah. Oh, sorry. So th there were uh, actually two. thousand people each. 
Could you say, and they're, they're both competitive, trying to yeah. uh, detect the Higgs first. Yeah. Could you say something about the relationship between these two groups? Yes, it's, it's, it's infinite. No. Um, the relationship is that we're not allowed to see their data, they're not allowed to see our data, but we talk about other stuff. The whole idea of having two incredibly expensive detectors built at the same time is that if one of them finds something, we don't have to wait another 30 years to see if the other one finds it as well. So we have to make sure they're independent. We can't have people showing each other their data. However, everybody wants to find things really fast, and the lab does not want to come out with a discovery if it's not right. So the lab also has motivation to get both experiments to see whether they see the same thing, right? They, before they announce something. So, you know, I think there's a lot of, this is the kind of thing that happens. Like, they'll show something and we'll go, yeah, sure, you know. Yeah, sure, I know, you, you weighted that distribution or, you know, whatever. And then we'll show something and they'll go, oh, yeah. And then we'll feel bad because we're a little bit later than them. They'll have more particles. We had kind of a weird thing where we were getting different masses for a while for the Higgs. So that was kind of exciting. And the, all the theorists were writing papers. And it was a very exciting time. But um, I, does that answer your question? It's sort of uh, it's synergistic, but we don't look at each other's data. We don't even look at our own data. <laughs> no, I mean, that's a really interesting thing. Half the time you put the data in a box, and only later you open it. Because we're so worried about our own biases. Because we know we're biased, so, you know, we say, okay, I'm not going to look. I'm not going to look. I'm not going to look. And then one day, we look. So that's kind of exciting. But it's not exciting not to look. So anyhow, we don't look in their box. They don't look in our box. We only look in our box at the end. And so do they. Yeah, anything else? Yeah, back there. Probably a dumb question, which will reveal how little I understand about this. But does the field? How much longer does the field last than the particle? The Higgs. Oh, the field is always there. So this. Imagine this. Is it still here from the Big Bang? This. Yeah. <laughs> this, this, yeah. The Higgs field is just there. Get used to it. <laughs> but we sort of disturb the field, make a Higgs boson, which immediately decays. Okay, but the field is always there. It's one of those things you can't turn off and on. Well, I hope. <laughs> haven't talked to the military, <laughs> but they haven't been able to turn off and on gravity, as far as I know. Yeah, it's not one of those things that you would want to turn off and on, like, like your lights. Yeah. Does that, does that make sense? It's, it's there. Yeah, the field. Yeah, in the back. Oh, yeah, did that help? Or, okay, okay. If, the, if there were no particles before the Big Bang, and then after the Big Bang, all these particles are created, uh, what happens to the end state of the particles when they decay and return to what sort of state? Or do they? disappear into dark matter, and then ultimately dark matter sort of spews them out again? Where do they go at the end? Wow, that's a really good question. So um, when particles decay, like a, the Higgs decays to two Zs, decays to electrons, and then those electrons become part of the steel of our, dete of our detector. <laughs> and then if you eat that steel, you, you take it also. Or if you rub the steel and inhale it, <laughs> you could. It could also. <laughs> yeah, so the particles lose energy. We make them interact. They lose energy until they either decay into the lowest, you know, like a muon will decay um, into an electron and two neutrinos, and that electron will just stick around in the, in the detector. So I'm not sure I'm answering your question, but the question was kind of cosmic, and this doesn't seem like a cosmic answer. But um, particles that decay, n nothing funny happens. There's nothing magical. It's all very quotidian. It's like every day. We oh, yeah. So, so did the Higgs field adopt a non-zero value 
when the ball rolls down to the yeah. uh, to the bottom. Uh, can we, uh, what, uh, after the end of inflation or during the inflation, can you make any comparison? Okay, so time as an experimentalist, I have to say we have no idea, right? I can't measure anything like that. I can't tell you when that nice, you know, potential that looked like a, a well, one well went to this one, okay, to the, to the sombrero. But, and I don't know how to do that experiment. So I was just sort of channeling theorists when I said that. But I don't like to do that too often because I get a headache. <laughs> so I don't know the answer. Um, there's lots of theorists who could probably. I don't know. I don't even know if inflation is. As an experimentalist, I refuse to accept anything <laughs> until we prove it. Although there is some evidence for inflation. Yeah, you have another question? OK. <laughs> I think I forgot. Oh. Do you want someone else to ask one and you think about it? We'll come back to you. There's a guy right there, right there, there. Um, I think it's really exciting that the, that the uh, collider is going to turn on again next year at like twice the speed. Um, I'm in the divinity school. Sometimes we talk about apocalyptic scenarios or whatever. <laughs> Could you cause the apocalypse by chance? <laughs> Swallow the world in an instant or something over there, make a mistake? <laughs> Uh, well, you know what, I think, you know, what I tried to show is that apocalypse could be in our future if, depending on what the Higgs field landscape looks like. The only way we could cause an apocalypse, well, I don't know, I mean, one way, <laughs> we could, I don't think we're going to cause an apocalypse. Either we're going to cause everything just being gone. <laughs> I don't think there's any apocalypse part, you know, the part where everybody's like eating everybody else and stuff like yeah. that. <laughs> uh, people were worried about a black hole, but black holes radiate away, you know, the kind of black, I'd love to make a black hole. I'd love to have a black hole in my lab. But, um, but black, the black, kind of black holes we would make would probably radiate away, just decay as everything else we do, apparently. It's everything decays. But so how sure about that probably are you? <laughs> um, like, I mean, could you yeah. really create a black hole? No, no, I mean, there's, compared to anything else in the world, you should not worry about this. Okay. This <laughs> I'll let the divinity school know. Thank you very yeah. much. <laughs> there's, actually, there's a paper written by a whole bunch of people at CERN with actual estimates, if you want to. Yeah. It's, it's slow. Um, should we, should we, should we, should we sing a song together and hold hands? <laughs> oh, well, we could break the glass. Does anybody want to see the glass break? Yeah. It's to certainly get people out of here who don't want to hear it. But. Oh, different glass. Oh. Oh, the glass boson. So while Daniel is doing this. Switch the source. Oh, switch the source. Switch the source. Switch the source. <laughs> Cross the beams. Okay. Okay, we are now seeing the apocalypse. Just, just, I just want to say when the boson decays, it's not this kind of decay we're talking about. What? Uh, no.
we got to get the right frequency. You know, I've tried this sometimes whenever I want it to break, it doesn't break. It's not even up. Hard to do this on, on, oh. <laughs> uh, thanks a lot, and if anybody has questions, they can always come up here.